It's Mark's gospel. And you'll notice there's no birth narrative. There's no genealogy. The good news starts with the prophetic words of Isaiah fulfilled through John the Baptist of announcing the good news for all people, especially the oppressed. We'll now hear this morning's reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, from the NRSV, from Brother Rod. Come on up, Rod. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> testing, testing. Okay, our reading, Mark, uh, the Gospel according to Mark, Chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. <clears throat> John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance, <clears throat> Uh, for the forgiveness of sins, and people from the whole Jordan countryside, and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river, Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descended like a dove on him and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Please pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts. Kindle us, each one of us, in the fire of your holy love. Send forth your spirit that we may all be renewed. And through you and in you and with you, we together shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Ah. <laughs> My glasses are fine. I think I'm going to just drop this just for the, so I can see. Um, this past Thursday, January 6th, marked the start of the Christian liturgical season of Epiphany. Epiphany. Webster's Dictionary describes it as a revelation, a moment in which you suddenly see or understand something in a new or very clear way. Webster's also writes, it's a Christian festival held on January 6th, honoring the three wise kings who come to worship Jesus. And that is a story that's full of revelation and epiphany. Think of it, these three wise kings coming from distant lands, crossing geographic boundaries, race, religion, making this long, hard journey guided by the star in search of divine love that would make us all one, only to find this one, ironically, as a toddler, born in a stable, ha ha, named Jesus. And they also encounter another king, a paranoid and ruthless king named Herod, so threatened by this prophecy that he plots to kill the child and orders a massacre of toddlers to eliminate their threat to his power. Epiphany reminds us that even amidst 
chaos and danger, that love breaks forth with a power that cannot be squelched by the evil acts of empires. Epiphany reminds us that there is a light that remains in the darkness and in the fog that compels us forward and that those voices crying out in the wilderness, they do not cry out in vain. And Epiphany reminds us of the hope embodied in one who came to live and serve among us in love so that we may all be one. Ah, so how ironic it was on that same date, one year ago, January 6th, 2021, that our democracy was once again challenged by an insecure ruler who resorted to evil to maintain power. Same old story. How ironic it is that this ruler unleashed some who professed Christianity and yet feared what the very celebration of Epiphany represents, the coming together of a diverse cultures and faiths across human created boundaries. How ironic it was that on the grounds of our capital, some citizens stormed the seat of our government waving American and Confederate flags and Christian banners conflating God and government in a futile attempt to thwart the peaceful transition of power for which our democracy is known. While some watched in horror and disbelief, white vigilantes that were spurred by the inflammatory lies of the former president and politicians and preachers and public figures who've chosen to follow him, they stormed the gates, scaled walls, built gallows, defaced public property, and ultimately caused the death of others. And they believed that they had a just cause, a holy cause. And now, a year later, 19 states have passed 34 laws restricting voting rights and impeding equal representation. If anything, this unholy insurrection has grown larger. And I too find myself in prayers just like the prayers of Isaiah. Oh God, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Where are you? Reveal yourself. Show yourself to us. Give us an epiphany. Wake us up. Help us to see the truth of what's happening before we tear this country and our world and ourselves apart. Can I get an amen? Amen. How many of you are just too overwhelmed to even take it in? It's like, oh, don't go there. Where's the good news? Reach it. Okay. It's an old, old story and it continues. And I, the good news is that our gospel reading today offers us some clues about the sort of epiphany that I believe Jesus in his time was seeking and that perhaps you and I, if we have the courage to do so, are seeking. Okay, so here come some clues. First clue, of all the mentors that Jesus could have picked, right? He chooses John a politically notorious prophet whose own days are numbered because of his calling to speak truth to power. Mark portrays John the Baptist as the re-embodiment of the great prophet Elijah. That's why he's eating locusts and wild honey and has that leather belt. Mark wants us, and he's in the wilderness, Mark wants us to be very clear that Jesus is choosing to follow in the footsteps of this tradition of prophecy which animates public consciousness, however offensive it might be to the national leadership, and which relentlessly advocates on behalf of the least, on behalf of those most marginalized. John's message is one of repentance, which is a call to a whole people to change their historic direction, not just their hearts. Jesus 
will take up the same proclamation after John is thrown into Herod's present prison and executed. Second clue, in Mark's story, this takes place in the wilderness as a location. Mark tells us that everyone comes from the center of society to meet John at the margins. The wilderness reminds us of the Exodus story and reminds us that the biblical God stands outside of civilization, undomesticated and wild, and is most reliably encountered not in the vortex of power, but in the void. John himself is this feral figure in his dress and his diet, and Jesus will, immediately after his baptism, be driven even deeper into the wilderness of his own vision quest. Their common experiment in prophetic renewal understood the need to retrace the footsteps of the ancestors, to go back, to find out what was so wrong, because only a radical diagnosis of the root causes could possibly bring forth healing. It's true for ourselves. It's true for countries. The third clue in Mark's depiction is the fact that while everyone else is being baptized in the Jordan, according to the Greek, Jesus is being baptized into the Jordan River, suggesting Jesus' deeper, more complete defection from the dominant culture his deeper dive into the depths of the older, deeper traditions, wiser traditions, and his complete immersion into this alternative vision of God's kingdom. So why did Jesus, and why would any of us in their right mind, choose this baptism, given its claim on our lives and given the cost? No wonder we've watered it down and made it so safe, a little sprinkling. A fourth clue in Mark's story suggests why we might and how. So Jesus rises up, Mark tells us, from the Jordan's waters to this vision of the heavens torn open. This alludes to that saying that Isaiah, his poignant, Lamentation, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, make your name known to your enemies and make the nations tremble at your presence, working unexpected miracles. That was third Isaiah. Indeed, from this prophetic perspective, which is firmly located among the marginalized, there's so much to lament. There was so much then in Jesus' time, and there is so much now. I mean, consider what we're going through. Now with this resurgent global pandemic, with the growing climate crisis, with the rise of white Christian nationalism in this country, with the rise of global wealth inequality, the rise of fascism and authoritarianism, the growing humanitarian crises, mass migration, transnational terrorism, and there's this risk of ever-growing interstate conflicts, exacerbated by this breakdown in the rules of international-based order and the spread of lethal autonomous weapons. Oh God, that you would tear open the heavens and come down now. We can't wait much longer. It is our most guttural instinct, visceral sense of justice. We are longing for the truth to come out, for the violence to end, for reconciliation at last. I believe that Jesus more than anything wanted that in his time, and he was willing to do anything. I believe he tore open his very self and surrendered. Take me, I'm yours. I turn my life over to you. Yet, in the moment of Jesus' baptism, as narrated by Mark, 
this prophetic longing, I believe, is realized by Jesus. Because not only do the, has Jesus opened himself completely, torn himself open, the heavens are torn open. The end of the separation, the spirit descends, and this long, silent voice is heard. You know, we might cringe at these stories of supernatural intervention. But I think this moment, this unspeakable, wondrous moment, holds the key to the true understanding of baptism. Jesus chose something beyond his own mind, beyond his own capacity. He surrendered his life over to this creator itself. And down Jesus goes, down, down, down into the river, getting down to the bottom of things. He's fully absorbed in the waters. And up he rises as in a mystical trance. And he's staring up through the water, rising up into the heavens. Perhaps he sees Jacob's ladder from all the stories of his faith into the axis mundi, through a cosmic wormhole, looking up right there. He sees a pillar of fire. He sees the eye of the storm. What does he see? I think it was a lot more than a dove. I think he sees it all. I think he sees how good the world is, ecstatically experiencing this untamed, wild, juicy power that's woven into all of creation. And he also sees how bad it is how alienated, degraded, how hostage to the powers of greed and objectification and domination. And he sees a vision of the redemption of everything. And then Jesus hears the voice, the voice that affirms his filial identity and demands a rupture with business as usual. It is his commissioning by the one who refuses to give up on us, the one who refuses to compromise with us and refuses to leave us stranded. I can hear you. Yeah, right. Nice story. You know, this moment couldn't be more incredible. But the story, you notice, doesn't beam Jesus up into like this alternative reality, you know, from this weary, hopeless world up into this blissful communion in heaven with the divine, you know, a salvation as, ex as escape version fantasy that we might script. Jesus remains there in the muddy Jordan, a member of people subject to a land occupied by an imperial army surrounded by grinding poverty and refugees and all kinds of illness. Jesus is stuck with us in this murderous history and this apocalyptic vision. It doesn't rescue him from it as if it was some cosmic lottery ticket or get out of jail free card. Rather, I believe that Jesus' vision at the Jordan compels him to struggle in and with that history, even unto death, but with a liberated sense, both of his own humanity and that of others, even his enemies. As Audre Lorde famously put it, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So it's into this wild baptism into discipleship that Jesus invites us again and again, every day, invites you and me and all of us, reminding us who we really are, God's beloved child, all of us. And if you remember Mark's gospel story, here we are at the beginning, the tearing open of the heavens at the Jordan is the beginning. And at the end, if you remember, as Jesus dies on the cross and he takes his last breath, 
It's the tearing open of the, the curtain with all the cosmos on it that separates the holiest of holies from the people. And it is torn from top to bottom. And to me, that, that reminds me that ultimately nothing, not empires, not religious institutions, not even death, can separate us from the truth and light and power and compassion and justice and love of God that we too are invited every day to embody. Empires come and go, but that spirit, that power lives on. And so this week, as we remember this tragedy, this travesty, the January 6th Epiphany Insurrection, let us also remember the resurrection that is to come. And let us do so with our hearts turned toward that light of revelation, of epiphany. Let us do so remembering that despite those restrictive laws in 19 states, that 25 states have enacted 54 laws with provisions to expand voting access. Let us do so knowing that now is the time to pass federal voting protections. Let us do so knowing that while many supported the insurrection, many more did not. And let us do so not made bitter, but made better by the challenge of so many who lost their way to love. And let us also remember that redemption is possible when we live out of love. My hope is that we learn from the tragedies of our past and move toward the light that is there within each one of us that's kindled in the fire of that everlasting power of love, knowing that love is the only thing that never dies. It is toward this light that we are called, and it is only in this light that we are truly made one. May it be so with us. Amen.